and the coming years in the area of national security are enormous. Some of the challenges are familiar to us. We've lived with them for years. Others seem very, very new indeed. The focus of tonight's remarks by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will be on uh, the importance of the war on terrorism, the way ahead. The, uh, our guest this evening, known by position to all of you, the pr principal advisor to the President of the United States on military affairs and to the Secretary of Defense and to the National Security Council. General Myers, uh, like so many military, off and military officers, is, tend to be from across the United States. Uh, General Myers was born in Kansas City, Missouri, attended Kansas State University, received his master's degree from uh, Auburn University. Uh, he continued his education in the military, attending the Air uh, uh, Command and Staff College at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base, the Army War College at Carlisle Barracks, and uh, the uh, Senior Executive Program in National and International Affairs at, at, at Harvard. Uh, command pilot with over 4,100 hours of flying, including 600 combat hours. He's held numerous command positions. Among them have been uh, commander of American forces in Japan in the 5th Air Force, uh, commander of Pacific Air Forces, uh, commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, uh, and uh, later, uh, during that, roughly during that same period of time, he was an assistant to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A few years ago, he became vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a position in which one is responsible for uh, very basic uh, considerations of uh, assessments and requirements, uh, and of course the uh, planning and programming and budget system. He now serves and has since October of 2001 as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as I said, the senior primary advisor to the President of the National Security Council and the Secretary of Defense. It's an enormous pleasure for me to present to you, and a great honor, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Richard B. Myers. Well, thank you very much, and thanks, Frank, for the, uh, for the kind introduction. And it is good to be in, in Baltimore this evening. The first attack came in the morning hours on a mid-September day. The events that unfolded would ultimately create a symbol of U.S. honor and resolve. The enemy picked what they thought was an easy target. They thought we would panic. They thought our young nation wouldn't know how to respond. But the U.S. troops at Fort McHenry that September in 1814 held their ground, <laughs> fought back, <laughs> and successfully defended Baltimore. <laughs> and the anthem inspired by that battle inspires hope and courage for millions of us today. Unfortunately, we're a nation at war once again. And I'm sure you realize this is a very different kind of war from the War of 1812, or for that matter, any we've fought since. I'd like to talk to you for just a minute about what this war on terrorism really means to our country, what I believe is at stake, and what it will take to win. The goal of terrorists, by definition, is to create fear. That's why they attack the softest, most visible targets they can find. That's why they attack innocent civilians. And that's why they attack again and again, adapting as best they can to our defensive measures. I believe that this terrorist threat is the biggest threat our nation has faced at least since the Civil War, perhaps ever. The stakes simply couldn't be higher. Think about it for just a minute, about the impact of September 11th of 2001. Of course, first and foremost is the, the toll in, in human lives. Roughly 3,000 people from 80 different countries who were murdered that day. And the families who are gonna have to live with those consequences and that loss forever. 
The monetary impact of those four attacks is also hard to define. There's property loss, of course, loss of income for businesses that lost offices, lost airline and tourism revenue, lost tax revenue, insurance costs, security costs. The list goes on and on. It's probably over a mile long. There are dozens of experts with dozens of estimates, but you can easily justify numbers in the hundreds of billions of dollars in what that one attack cost this country. Then you've got to consider also the toll on our nation in terms of our, our freedom and our prosperity, the secondary and subsequent ripples through our lives. For example, consider the impact on the airline industry, industry alone. I doubt if any of us today have booked tickets on the airlines or complete a journey without the shadow of 9-11 somewhere in our thoughts as we do that. And I don't think it takes a lot of imagination to envision what another wave of attacks or attack could do to this nation of ours. And as I see it, failure is simply not an option. The enemy we face is smart, they're agile, they're adaptable. They're planning the next attack right now, you can be sure of that. So we can't just huddle in a defensive crouch and hope for the best. And that's why we have to fight this war in ways we've never fought wars in the past. It's going to take a tremendous amount of patience, a tremendous amount of will and commitment on the part of our entire nation and, and our allies, for that matter, to be victorious. When I talk about commitment, I'm not talking about committing military forces. It would be very wrong to assume that the military alone can win this war. It's going to take virtually all agencies of our government working together more closely than we ever have before. And that includes not just the Department of Defense, but the Department of State, Department of Homeland Security, and also Justice and Commerce and Treasury. And we could go on as many agencies and departments as we have because everyone who deals with this, down to law enforcement, down to municipal level, uh, state level, has to be part of this. You caught a glimpse of this interagency coordination over the holidays when the terrorist threat level was elevated for a week or so. It took a really integrated effort to respond as we did to the intelligence that we had. And you probably also realized that we wouldn't have been as successful preventing terrorist attacks without a coherent international effort as part of that as well. This holds true for anti-terrorist efforts, the defensive part of the war, as well as our operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa, Colombia, the Philippines, and other places around the globe. Some 95 countries now support the war on terrorism, whether we're talking troops on the ground, basing, basing or logistics supply, or intelligence gathering, it is clearly and has been for some time an international effort. Our government is absolutely committed to winning this war. Our coalition partners are committed to winning this war as well. But winning also requires the commitment of the American people. Despite the enormously high stakes, the impact on most Americans' daily lives is pretty minimal. We aren't rationing gas or conducting scrap drives or planting victory gardens like we did during World War II. Daily life for most Americans is unaffected by the fact that, in fact, we are a nation at war. But this isn't the time to retreat into the comfort of our daily lives and ignore what's going on in the world. So I can tell you right now, I'm really encouraged to see all of you out here today. The fact that you chose to be engaged and informed on foreign affairs means that you take your role as citizens very, very seriously. And uh, I thank you for that, because that's what's going to keep this country great. Can I see a show of hands for how many of you in the audience today have um, a friend or a relative or a family member of other sorts in the Guard or Reserve who's been called up since 9-11? How many folks? Okay. You're a little more directly <laughs> involved in this, uh, in this conflict because uh, that call up clearly Im impacts their families, uh, their communities, and their employers. What we're doing is everything we can to minimize the impact to all of the above, to make sure that our Guard and Reserve personnel aren't on active duty a day longer than required, and we're trying to give them as much notice as possible so they can better plan their lives. 
About 7% of our Guard and Reserve personnel have been called up more than once in the last 14 years. 7% in the last 14 years. And it may seem initially like a pretty small number, but we're looking at, at those specialties that are in, in high demand to make sure we have the right amount of each capability and the responsibility is shared as equitably as we can among our entire active or reserve component. We definitely appreciate the reserve component service. There has been never been a more important time for them to serve. For all our troops, active, guard, reserve, this is really their moment to determine what the future will look like, whether the freedoms we've defended for the last 200 plus years will survive for our children or our grandchildren. Osama bin Laden, for one, has said that he wants to reduce America to a shadow of its former self, and he really thought it would be easy. And he badly underestimated the will and resolve of our men and women in uniform. I have the great privilege of visiting them all over the world, in the Middle East, other places, and it's always a tremendously positive experience. I am also fortunate enough to, to be close enough to Walter Reed and Bethesda Naval Hospital to be able to visit um, our wounded there as well. And I can tell you, I always get a positive response. One soldier, a 21-year-old, who'd been wounded for a while in the leg was at Walter Reed. And he said, I want to get back to my unit as quickly as I can. He was an artilleryman. Uh, he'd been uh, asked to assist with the governance, with the municipal uh, governor, governance in Kirkuk. And he said, I want to go back and continue to help him. I felt like a rock star there. I mean, the Iraqi children run up, the other Iraqis want to take their picture with me. He says, where can a 21-year-old have this kind of impact on, on the lives of so many people? And that was not an isolated story. I mean, that's, that's the story you, when you meet these folks who've had their lives altered by, by the wounds they've received. He understood the mission perfectly and the impact of his contributions. Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and other terrorist elements are finding out just how strong our will is. There's no way that we're going to lose this war because we know what's at stake. I won't tell you that we're not asking an awful lot out of our troops right now because we are. And the fact is they're delivering. They're well trained, they're professional, and they're respected around the world as much for their character and their compassion as for their courage and their combat capability. They are, without a doubt, our most treasured resource, and we don't take them for granted. They're an all-volunteer force, and we can't forget that. And we're certainly paying close attention to the retention and recruiting of all the components, and by that, by that I mean all the components, active, guard, and reserve. In the four services, only one, the Army National Guard, fell short of its recruiting goals last year in 2003. We haven't seen any problems with the retention part, retaining those that are already recruited in any of the services, either last year or this year. At least not yet. But we can't just focus on the snapshot right now. We have to look out you know, two, three, four, five years. We don't want to create a crisis after this major effort is over. So we're paying close attention to the stress levels on our forces, and we're always working on quality of life for them, including pay and benefits and family support mechanisms. You may have seen some discussion in the news about increasing our total force strength. We're looking at all these options very, very closely. It's tempting to say if we had one or two more Army div divisions, we'd be in great shape and all our problems would go, go away in terms of our operations temp tempo. And I'm sure Napoleon would be very comfortable with that logic. But of course, it's a lot more complicated today. I'm not sure what next year will look like for the war on terrorism. Is our operations tempo that we're experiencing today a spike, or is it a new plateau or baseline? Anyone who tells you they have the answer to that is probably for sure going to be mistaken. It's our, our job to figure out how best to prepare for that uncertainty. And I think the solution lies in the capability and the flexibility and the availability of the 1.4 million troops we have on active duty and the additional 860,000 in the Guard and Reserve. We have about today, we have about 210 servicemen and women 
deployed for the war on terrorism. That's about 10% of our total force. But we admit that we're stressed. So we're looking for new ways to increase the number of personnel available to deploy. And that's the heart of what General Schoomaker has done as the Chief of Staff of the Army, working on ideas to restructure their combat forces to increase the number of combat brigades significantly, with only a small increase in total force strength. The Navy's already done similar things in terms of redesigning their deployment concepts, and they're going to tailor both the size and the length of battle group deployments to the situation, keeping more of their forces ready and on call for crises that may develop. These are just two examples, and we need to look for more approaches like these. It just makes common sense in my view. Simply increasing end strength is a very lengthy and expensive solution. We spend about 60% of our budget in personnel cost, and most of you in this audience and business know that's roughly the number you spend. It's quite high. It also takes a lot of time to stand up, recruit, stand up, and train forces to be effective. If we need to do that, make no mistake, we will. We'll make those recommendations, and we'll take those to the Secretary and the President. But right now, I don't think that we've made, made the case, and none of the Joint Chiefs of Staff do. The future is definitely uncertain, but I will tell you that I think it's going to be a long war, and for that, we have to be very, very patient. The war in Afghanistan, Operation Enduring Freedom, is into its third year. We've toppled the Taliban regime, disrupted al-Qaeda training camps, and captured or killed many terrorist leaders. We're still conducting major offensive operations against elements and remnants of the Taliban and al-Qaeda. We also have 12 provincial reconstruction teams building schools and clinics and roads and providing security. And I say we because the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, is a big part of this. They're leading one of the provincial reconstruction teams as well as providing the, the command and control and the forces for the security force. We call it the International Security Assistance Force around Kabul. So there is a NATO flag planted a long way from NATO territory because they see it in their security interest. The formula for success in Afghanistan, in my view, has three parts. You've got to work the security piece, you've got to work the economic growth piece, and you've got to have sound government. And all three really have to take place basically simultaneously for you to be successful and to prevent the kind of environment that allows terrorists to flourish, flourish or thwart your efforts in any one of those three categories. The formula for success in Iraq is, is the same. And we're making steady progress there as well, which doesn't mean in either case, Afghanistan or Iraq, that they're not going to be more vehicle-borne explosive devices to go off because there will. Uh, this is a very violent part of the world that will continue to be violent for some time to come. So there are going to be many challenges for the military and others. In Iraq, we've already completed thousands of projects throughout the country, everything from clearing irrigation canals to rebuilding schools, providing school supplies. We're getting a lot of intelligence now from the Iraqi people who, when the fear is reduced, come forward with information, information that we then use to go out and, and take on those that are perpetrating these these uh, terrorist acts. Even with our successes, we have to stay focused. We could easily mistake important milestones such as a transfer of sovereignty, an election, or a new constitution for the finish line. But it's more than that, and we have to stay and finish the job that we've begun. Patience will continue to be an important factor in the coming months. Iraq and Afghanistan are already better members of the international community than they were under the brutal regimes of their recent past. If we continue on the course we have set, their potential as stabilizing influence in the region is, in my view, enormous. When U.S. forces defended Baltimore so bravely at Fort McHenry nearly 200 years ago, they were fighting for survival of one of history's boldest experiments, a society founded on the concept of human liberty. Clearly, it's no longer an experimental idea. But we are called upon it to defend it again and again. I'd like to share with you some words. Maybe you saw them in the paper. It's been many months now. Uh, by a fighter pilot when he asked why he fought. And this would not be me because I could not write words this eloquently, but this, this fighter pilot could write. He said, I would say that I was fighting the war to rid the world of fear. Of the fear of fear is perhaps what I mean. If they win the war, only the bad guys 
will dare do anything. All courage will die out in the world, the courage to love, to create, to take risk, whether physical or intellectual or moral. Men will hes hesitate to carry out the promptings of the heart or the brain because having acted, they will live in fear that their action may be discovered and themselves cruelly punished. Thus all love, all sp spontaneity will die out of the world. Thought will have petrified, the oxygen breathed by the soul, so to speak, will vanish and mankind will wither. Those were the wor words of a British fighter pilot in World War II. And I put bad guys in there instead of Germans because I wanted you to think it was contemporary. But it goes, it goes back there. It still applies today. I was speaking to an American Bar Association dinner the other, other night, and someone in the audience said, you know, this ought not to be the war on terrorism. It should really be called the war for freedom from fear. And he was speaking about President Roosevelt's 1941 for freedom speech. President Roosevelt said in that speech that he hoped for a secure world founded upon four basic freedoms. Freedom, from, freedom of expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. He understood that when fear, fear reigns, the human spirit is in fact diminished, but when there's freedom from fear, freedom from terror, then human dignity, creativity, and productivity have a place to thrive. And that's what this war in the end is really all about. So I'll borrow President Roosevelt's closing words in that 1941 speech where he said, quote, our strength is the unity of purpose and there can be no end save victory. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments on our purposes and the, and the spirit of the enterprise. Mr. Shore, your question. The war on terror is a, essentially a war against groups unidentified by state, uh, amorphous, difficult to pin down. So my question is, is there any realistic po end specific point where we can declare victory? Or is this war on terrorism essentially the creation of a permanent national security state? That's a very good question. It's an excellent question. Uh, it is a different, a different threat, and it is, I mean, we talked uh, in the last century about, the, about asymmetric threats, and terrorism is quintessential asymmetric threat, and they, they don't have the things nation states have, but they take advantage of the things that nations have and that our international community has. Uh, the best example is probably the information technology. They, they leverage trillions of dollars in, in IT to further their, their aims. Uh, I think, I think we, we can win this war, and, uh, and I'll just make this real brief. Uh, as I said in my remarks, it cannot be the military alone that wins this war. It's going to take all our instruments of national power, it's going to take the international community to come together with all their instruments of national power and decide that uh, the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and their delivery means is, is unacceptable. That this, this uh, if you will, grand insurgency of extremism is not acceptable as well. And that means that in the end, you've got to um, create an environment where young people don't feel like they want to join this, this movement. They have other, other ways they can go with their lives. And right now, that is not always the case, as you know. A lot of them are, are not, well, there's a, a big uh, demographic uh, issue in the Middle East. Uh, lots of young people are not particularly well educated to join this world and, and the, the economics of this world and educated uh, uh, to some degree, and in some instances, uh, in extremism. And we've got to turn that around. But that's going to be an international community effort. It's not, certainly not going to be done by people in uniform. We're going to have to play our role in that. But I, I do think we can, we can have an end state here uh, that is uh, where you could, you could claim victory. And, but it's going to take, take all of us pulling together. Uh, speaking of weapons of mass destruction, We've had uh, Saddam Hussein in custody now for several months, and I'm wondering if he's revealing any of the whereabouts of the mysterious weapons of mass destruction. The answer is no, he is not. He's, uh, he has not been particularly cooperative, it turns out. And um, he has not been particularly cooperative, as it turns out, and uh, has, uh, uh, I, I'll just leave it there. He's, he's not provided much useful information. 
But, 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 but those that, that uh, had the greatest fear in, the, uh, in that regime have provided information to our folks. So um, I would tell you that the effort that goes on for in the, in the whole uh, weapons of mass destruction sphere and delivery means continues like it, like it has uh, uh, before the K report, after the K report. We have over 1,000 people working that issue, and more will be discovered. There seems to be a serious disagreement in, uh, surrounding the Patriot missile, uh, both the accuracy and the efficiency of the Patriot missile, as well as the information that um, was given to the American people when it was used both in um, the first Iraq war and then later. Could you address that? I can address the, uh, the conflict that, was, that I'm closest to, and that was the, the one in Iraq. The Patriot uh, missile, uh, uh, both versions that we had over there, performed very, very well. And we know, we know exactly what it did and what it didn't do. But it's, uh, it was a, a vast improvement. The, the work that went on in the decade between the first operation in the Gulf and this operation there was a vast improvement in the, uh, in the capability of the Patriot uh, system, and it performed very, very well. I don't have the statistics at my, my fingertip. My guess is they're probably on some DOD website because uh, we kept very good track of that. Uh, the, the history on the first one was, I think, um, well, it, it is what it is. I mean, I think most people, I think the, the facts are out now, and, we, and, and people know that it was uh, somewhat successful, but not successful enough. The, the biggest loss of life we had in the first Gulf War was on the barracks in Dahran, Saudi Arabia, uh, where I believe uh, 26 uh, service members lost their life due to a, a, a fairly uh, uh, old uh, ballistic missile that they fired in from, from Iraq. And, and so, so we had a lot of issues, but we fixed those issues working up to this war, and it, it performed very, very well. And I don't, think, I don't know of any controversy about it. I've not seen any controversy in the press about the system because the facts are extremely well known. Well, actually, the controversy that I was referring to was on a segment on 60 Minutes, and they went from the first Iraq war when 44 missiles were, Patriot missiles were fired, and it was reported, they said, to the American people that 42 were successful, whereas later on the truth came out that there were only four that were successful. It was disturbing to hear that. Yeah. The facts on this, I, I can't address that because those facts aren't as fresh in my mind, but the facts on this one, because uh, we've, we've looked at that as a, the Joint Chiefs have been briefed on that. We know uh, precisely, because we were watching it very closely. You know, it's a very important system to protect our folks. Thank you. Thank you. You were involved with Space Command, and I am a space buff. I'm extremely interested in the uses of aerospace in warfare. And I was amazed at how quickly, I think it was called shock and awe, that we were able to uh, occupy Iraq. And I'd like to have some idea of how aerospace was used, you know, either satellites or, or what have you, and what is the future of space in terms of warfare? Uh, let's we'll take the pieces of it. Um, uh, communications, I mean, we had, uh, we, bought a lot of bandwidth in the commercial sector and used our military satellites, communication satellites, uh, extensively in this conflict, absolutely required for the kind of information we were trying to pass around the battlefield, let alone control predators from uh, the continental United States and, and pass the imagery around and so forth. So it, uh, that was one piece that was a real success and in line with our, with the philosophy that we would use a lot of the commercial capacity for space communications, we did that. We did exactly that. I forget the exact number, but it's, I think it was over 70% where we used commercial. Um, the only other system I'd talk about is the global positioning system, which pr provides all of you and all our folks, if you want to go fishing or anything else, I mean, if you want to know exactly where you are and how fast you're going in a given direction, and what your altitude is, it can do that for you. And so one of the things that you didn't see uh, so well, if you remember, uh, the dust storms and the reporters reporting the dust storms and, uh, and then the, the comments from the media that, gee, we're in a quagmire at this point. What you didn't see going on was that the Iraqi forces and their positions were well understood because we had either airborne radars or other ways to know exactly where they were. And then we had uh, weapons that were guided by satellite signals that didn't care what the weather was. They were going to go to precise coordinates on the ground. And so while uh, ground forces were 
regrouping, waiting for the weather to get a little bit better, uh, the, the war went on. And it wasn't well understood or well reported, but that was enabled by space, for instance, and aerospace, did, for that matter. Did it impress you very much? I mean, were you truly impressed, or did, was it just sort of business as usual? <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. And I, I, I tell you the other thing it did. I'll tell you why I'm impressed and, and why it's most important to think about being impressed about this. Um, the other thing it did with uh, so-called satellite-guided weapons is that uh, there is, and I'll state this categorically, but given the magnitude of the task we were assigned by the present president of this country, uh, there has never been a more humane operation. And, and precision weapons help us do that, and space helps us make our weapons precision, whether it's the intelligence we get from space or the, the, uh, the positioning signals, either one. So, sure, I'm very impressed. I mean, it's such a, it's such a difference from just a decade ago. It's a, it's, a, it's a, a quantum leap would, is, is exactly the right order of magnitude leap, I guess, would be exactly the right way to say it. General, um, the a predecessor of yours seemed to feel like we needed a, a larger force structure in Iraq to accomplish our mission and to keep our troops safe. So my simple question, I'm sure it's not an easy answer, but do we have enough troops and can we maintain enough troops and force structure in Iraq to accomplish our mission and to keep our troops safe. People, as I, as I indicated in my remarks, people who think in terms of number of troops, um, and I said it flippantly in my remarks, and I'll say it flippantly again here, uh, Napoleon would be proud because you think in terms of, of gross numbers. And what we're thinking about is in terms of capability. The forces, we did get criticism uh, in late March uh, about the number of forces we had committed to the uh, to the battle in Iraq. And in fact, it took us three weeks or whatever it was to get, or a little over three weeks to get to Baghdad. So we had exactly the forces the combatant commander and his subordinate commanders wanted for that operation. He could have had any number of forces he wanted for. There was no pressure on him, as is a bit some think, that somebody squeezed him down and said, OK, you can only have so many forces. That is just absolutely rubbish. He had what he wanted. In today's world, like I said in my remarks, what we have to, we have to develop capability. What General Schoomaker has done with the Army is he's looked at his Army and says, you know, we have about 33 brigades that we can deploy today. With a little bit of reorganizational effort, I can make that 43 brigades. With just a little bit of organizational effort. What I'm talking about, instead of making the division, the unit of combat power that the Army centers around, they'll make it the brigade. And so some of these units that or attached at division level will come down now and flesh out more brigades. He'll get more brigades at essentially no cost, and he's going to have a, a modest increase in, uh, in his force strength to do that, uh, several tens of thousands to do that, which he's, under our emergency powers right now, he's already got about a third of the force he needs to, to, to be the shock absorber while he transforms how he's organized for this. And that will give us a lot more capability. 43 brigades to deploy is a lot more than, than 33, and he can do this, he thinks. Uh, fairly quickly. And then he has an off-ramp there to stop there or to go to more, depending upon uh, the, the security environment we find ourselves in. And, and that's what I said in my remarks. If we, if we can convince ourselves we can make the case for, for a larger armed forces, we will do that. Um, as far as how that relates to Iraq, um, we have a, a large force in Iraq right now. We have about 124,000 going to something less than that in this next rotation. You may, we're in the middle of a rotation right now to Iraq. Uh, we've moved about 40,000, roughly, people in, and about 25,000 out. And when it's all said and done, we're going to have over 110,000 moving in, and those 124,000 moving out. That's a pretty big movement, and nobody's heard much about it. There's not been much. It just, it's, it's going very well because the professionals are doing that. We have uh, about uh, 13,000 in Afghanistan that also have to move, not exactly at this time, but also move. So we have, we have a lot of forces out and about, and to include our, the uh, Guard and Reserve that I talked about. But as that relates to um, force protection, again, that is not an issue of, uh, uh, we don't think, of numbers. It's, it's, a, it's an issue of the kind of capability we have, the intelligence we have, and the ability to defeat those folks that are willing to either commit suicide or plant these improvised explosive devices. 
And we've got a full court press on those sorts of things. We have some shortfalls, for sure, but they're not generally in people. They're generally in some of the equipment that would help protect our troops. And as the threat environment uh, changes a little bit, we've got to change that, that force, that, that equipment mixture, and we're, we're doing that. If a civil war does occur in Iraq, how does the coalition plan to respond? What the uh, questioner is referring to is, uh, and maybe you saw it, there was this letter from a fellow named Zarqawi, who um, was writing this letter to the Al-Qaeda asking for help. And he says, part of our strategy ought to be, since the coalition won't go away, since they're showing a lot of resolve, maybe if we start a civil war inside uh, Iraq, uh, we can destabilize this, this uh, country to the place where it can't have a constitution, hold elections, and so forth. And um, we're working really hard right now not to let that happen. And, and, and I don't know, I don't even know the likelihood of that happening. Uh, if it were to happen, of course, that would change the security environment uh, fairly dramatically inside the country. Uh, what I have not mentioned, and uh, what you'd have to consider as you think about how you might handle that, is that we have over 200,000 Iraqis now as part of the security force. In fact, the exact number is about 209,000. And these are the police, the border security, uh, the people that provide security for the uh, infrastructure, the power lines and so forth, called the Facilities Protection Corps. We have an Iraqi Civil Defense Corps, and we have the new Iraqi Army. Five entities, about 209,000, at varying states of training and equipage and so forth, to include the police. Not all the police are, are fully equipped and trained and so forth. But they're all essentially on duty uh, and we're trying to catch up with the training and all those pieces so they can be a very effective fighting force. They have taken, um, uh, by official figures, almost as many casualties uh, to combat as we have since the end of major combat operations. Uh, by unofficial estimates, maybe way more than we have. And yet they keep lining up to uh, try to make Iraq a better place for, for their citizens. It's, it's remarkable, really, because, uh, well, there was just uh, another attack on a, a, a police station today that you all read about, where I think uh, the last number I saw was 10 killed and, and probably 40 wounded from a, a vehicle-borne improvised explosive device. Um, so I, I can't answer you directly because we're getting in the operational side, but I can tell you we have, it would, uh, it, would, uh, it would not be a good thing and that we would have to rethink our whole security, security structure. What we're, where we're really focused now is trying to make sure that all the entities inside that country, no matter what their ethnic background or religious background, is that they all ha feel like they have a, a share in the outcome of what might happen in Iraq. And it's, uh, it's tough work. And that's what Ambassador Bremer is about and, and a lot of other folks over there. And that's why going to Iraqi sovereignty and, and this transitional administrative law followed by a constitution is so important is to get get them to start thinking in terms that we started to think about uh, several hundred years ago, but, and we've come to believe that a piece of paper and uh, the rule of law, that you can all get along and, and figure out how you're supposed to do your business. And they, uh, they've got to be convinced of that and, and take that responsibility and move out. So we're going to try our best to avoid that situation of a, of a civil war. So there's no plan? Oh, no, there's no, no. <laughs> okay. No? No, if the, that's good. <laughs> that's good. No, there is, there is absolutely a plan. I'm talking about some of the strategies, though, for avoiding what would be a very dire consequence. So, but I'm not going to get into the oper operational details of planning like that. The 55-year-old uh, Arab-Israeli conflict uh, has been characterized by six uh, wars between the Israeli army and, and combined Arab armies and just a string of terrorist incidents, all the way from the original bombing of the King David Hotel by the Haganah uh, in Irgun, through the uh, bombing of the American Embassy in Beirut, the uh, Marine Barracks in Beirut, the Achille Lauro hijacking, the, hi the kidnapping of the Israeli Olympic team, et cetera, et cetera. The firing of the 39 Scud rockets from Iraq and Israel, all of that. A number of my friends believe that this current phase on the war on terrorism, to include the attack, the 9-11 attack, are simply an extension of that. 
What, what is your view on that, that uh, line of reasoning? And if you disagree with it, what do you think the motive of the terrorists in attacking, wanting to attack America is? The attack on the World Trade Center was perpetrated by the Al-Qaeda. In all the readings that I have done on Al-Qaeda and their thoughts uh, and their strategic concept leading up to 9-11, um, I don't think that the Middle East conflict was itself much of a factor. I think it was, it was much more against the, the West. Now, as it is perceived by the Al-Qaeda and others that the West supports Israel unconditionally, uh, it, could, it could be a factor. But it was not, a, in my view, from what the readings I've done, it was not a, not a major factor in 9-11. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe that logic. Not from what I've read. Uh, you mentioned Zarqawi uh, a few minutes ago, who I believe was a Jordanian national. Um, from a military perspective, to best win the war against terror, why was reg regime change in Iraq chosen as a priority as opposed to using those troops for a major offensive against uh, dealing specifically with al-Qaeda and terrorist elements in the mountainous regions uh, of Afghan and Pakistan? You often see criticism say, gee, uh, the decision was made to go into Iraq and that meant you had to, uh, you, you couldn't continue this battle against al-Qaeda. And uh, I would disagree with that. Uh, if you look at the number of significant senior al-Qaeda that were picked up in this basically same time frame, pretty substantial number. Uh, the problem with uh, the top leadership of al-Qaeda is that uh, they take advantage of an area in, on the Afghan-Pakistan border that is, um, that is uh, very, a very tough environment in terms of the mountains and so forth, as you know. But also, um, clearly Afghanistan has no government to get influence, but Pakistan hasn't been in their, uh, their, those areas as, as well. So it's, it's ungoverned space. There is a line that's supposed to uh, be the, uh, to mark the border, but even the line, even the Duran line wasn't, and Duran admitted it, you know, he said it wasn't exact, not exactly perfect. I'm not sure I know where it is in all, in all cases. So it's a very difficult environment where the, the tribes that live there move back and forth at will, and they don't realize, recognize the border. And so it becomes a very complex problem. It's more than just troops again. You've got a, the sovereign country of Pakistan that you have to uh, work with to help with this particular problem. And uh, in fact, that's what we're doing. They're, they're being a, a very good ally on this piece of it. It's just tough for them too, because they're not wanted in that, same, that very same area. So it's, again, it's not a matter on the premise of your question, if we put more effort there, um, I don't think, it, I, I, I disagree with the premise. I, I think you misunderstood my premise. Okay. The premise wasn't uh, the number of troops it had to do with the priority. My understanding was that the Al-Qaeda uh, operatives that we captured came into uh, Iraq after we had... Well, I'm uh, talking about around the world and other places like in Pakistan uh, that, we, that we picked up people. But you well. think from a military perspective, a, a it attack not, on, yeah, on it, we, Iraq we were, was... Uh, one of the things we had to look at, and one of the things where we had to provide advice, and I had to provide advice, is, um, you know, if you do Iraq, what else in the world are, are you or aren't you able to do? And so we looked at this very, this very question. Al Qaeda was a big piece of that. Also, was our other treaty requirements around the world. What if um, uh, we looked at uh, the tension on, on the Korean Peninsula? What if something flared up there? Do we have the forces to go uh, meet our commitments there? Uh, China, Taiwan, on and on it goes. And uh, so the premise, I, okay, I'll go back to, I'll attack this premise then. The premise uh, that we didn't have, that we let up on Al-Qaeda during operations in Iraqi freedom, I don't, I don't agree with because that's what we focus on. The main premise focus. was priority. As but I'm just saying, we, prior, saying. we can do both of those. Okay. They were both top priorities. Yeah, the Al nobody has ever taken their eye off the Al-Qaeda ball because right now they're the most dangerous when we talked about the kind of threat we're facing uh, they're, the, they're the ones that are the biggest threat right now. Thank you, sir. I understand that in the uh, Pentagon budget, there is provision for the development of a nuclear device that would um, create explosions underground, and that this is, maybe it's already started for development in the Pentagon. At the same time, our president is um, adopting a policy or an urging us to curb all development of nuclear devices throughout the world. Isn't this a double standard? 
and doesn't this affect the credibility of the United States? It's a great question. Um, what's in the budget, what's in the budget, by the way, is a, a study. A, a study? A study, not the development of a weapon, a study on, well, it's a lot different. There's, you have to have, Congress has to prove the development of any weapon. And you'll, if you read the congressional language, I think it was in last year as well, you'll see that it authorized only a study and that if uh, you'd have to come back to Congress to get approval for any development work. So it was a study to see if some of the current weapons could be modified uh, to provide a certain operational task. Um, you're right, the, uh, the president said uh, we've got too many nuclear warheads out there on systems and uh, agreed with the Russians to come down to this number of 1,700 to 2,200 uh, and we agree to do that together over the next several years. Uh, and, that, and that work is, is progressing. The other, the other point is, uh, because people will say this, and I just offer it as, as food for thought. I'm not telling you it's my opinion necessarily, but it's food for thought. There was a time in this world when both the then Soviet Union and the United States had thousands upon thousands upon thousands of very small nuclear weapons. And at the, t at the time, I don't think anybody thought that the nuclear threshold was necessarily lowered. The argument in this case is that, gee, if we make a, a nuclear weapon that can do a specific task, and this is for, uh, for deeply buried targets, for instance, that that would somehow lower the nuclear threshold. And I only ask the people think about, there was a time when we had thousands of, I mean, the suitcase nukes. Now, we didn't have them, but Soviet did. So did that, is, is that... Is that good, bad, provide deterrence? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there so you understand all the elements of the, and things to think about. But it's, right now it's a study. There's no development going on. Well, just the thought of a study is something else. Yep. Well, check, check the congressional record and check the budget request because that's, uh, that's where we are. And I wanted to ask you, you touched on the Philippines, and I wanted to know, uh, apparently the uh, terrorist networks are infiltrating themselves very well because of the geography of that country, and if they are, how can we work jointly with that government to prevent them from using that area as an operations base to uh, promote terrorism? Uh, the way we, uh, we can do it with uh, many instruments of our national power, when you talk about the military, what we have done is we're trying to provide assistance to the Philippine Armed Forces so they can be better prepared to deal with those kind of threats that you just, you just went through. Um, there is a tie between um, several of the uh, groups in the Philippines that would uh, uh, that have taken on the government to include the Abasayev group but others a tie between them and other organizations that eventually wind their way back to Al-Qaeda okay so I mean there is there is funding and other support uh, uh, bomb making expertise that that feeds into these organizations we had a major operation uh, as opposed to training assistance we had a major operation uh, I think it was about 18 months ago now, where we went into one of the islands in Mindanao, um, uh, a, a place that uh, had been essentially neglected by the central government of the Philippines, and where Abasayev had their headquarters. And we went in there uh, with the Philippine Armed Forces, uh, drove the Abasayev off. Uh, we built a, a ring road around this island, which is the first time they've had all weather, all year access, because every time the rains came, it washed part of this road away. Um, we actually had the Navy and the Marines, the CBs and, and Marine engineers, doing half of it. And so there was good competition there to see who would finish first. Um, we, dug, we dug wells because I forget the number of, the, the child mortality was just huge because of the, the water. And they were losing, I mean, I mean, a child a day or whatever it was. And, and so we, we did wells. We, did, we brought a lot of services to them that convinced the population that the, uh, they were better off not supporting the Abbasayev group and uh, hoping that, that, would, that the Philippine Armed Forces and the Philippine government would see the virtue of those sorts of actions. But that's right now we're in the train and help equip the Philippine Armed Forces, providing them advice. Uh, we, can, we can provide them help in operational planning. We can provide them some intelligence. Uh, but we don't have uh, our forces doing any of, the, any of the fighting for them right now. And, that's, and, it can, and it can be more than, and this, the programs that I'm talking about are mainly Department of State, Department of Defense, uh, but there are other uh, work going on, I'm sure, by other elements of our government to try to, to, try to help them have the, the expertise and the know-how to take on these threats. Is it true that there's a new and emerging element amongst uh, 
terrorist networks that are very adept at fighting in areas of the world where there's lots of water, like they are now in mountainous areas? I think uh, as, they, as they plan and train, they will go to those areas that are least governed. And there, there's lots of pockets of those around the world, it turns out. And uh, the Horn of Africa is another area that we watch very closely for, for groupings that, uh, that could be doing the same thing that happened in Afghanistan that resulted in 9-11. Absolutely. That is a worry. Um, we're obviously in the middle of major nation-building efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, we have two templates of very successful efforts post-World War II in Japan and Germany. I guess my question is twofold. A, what are we taking from those efforts as lessons into Iraq and Afghanistan? And B, what are we having to really learn on the fly? What, the last part, what we? What are we having to learn on the fly, like, like you know, on the job training? Uh, let me just ripple off some answers. In Iraq, the, the one thing that was a little bit surprising was this, the, the state of disrepair of the infrastructure. It surprised us how dilapidated uh, their electrical infrastructure was, for starters. Um, I think we also had to cope with uh, looting and sabotage on infrastructure that uh, uh, was greater than we, we had uh, planned for. And so we've, that's why we have these facilities protection service. Uh, I think the number the number's up in the 70, 80, 90,000 of them out there trying, protecting their own infrastructure from that. But even things as is, uh, is complicated as uh, converting their currency in Iraq. Uh, the folks that did that, and again, it wasn't the military, but uh, in the meetings, uh, they went back in history and, and talked about how that was done and the, and the pitfalls and the pros and cons <coughs> of how it was done in, in uh, Germany's case, for sure, I know. I, I don't know that I remember the Japanese case. Uh, so they went, they're trying to use all those lessons. I mean, everybody that tries to do something in this, in this uh, big undertaking, particularly in Iraq, is trying to use those lessons that we have learned uh, to include how, how you handle detainees and uh, what, what is the process for handling, you know, those, those sorts of folks. But there have been a lot of lessons uh, learned on the fly because of the, uh, uh, the security situation and how it has changed in the, uh, up until probably, I mean, for, for a good bit of time, the, the primary threat we were facing were the former regime elements, the, old, the Ba'athist, and that looks like that's moving more and more now to, uh, I'll use the term jihadists, but the foreign fighters who aren't part of the, weren't part of the former regime and so forth, and so we have to cope with that security situation at the same time we're trying to do the other things uh, we're, we're trying to do. But I, I'd say that the, uh, the folks that are responsible for this, and you're, this is an area that's not my primary area in, in many respects, uh, have have used those lessons, I think, and have tried to use them, and still use them today as we, as we go forward. Uh, I haven't talked to Ambassador Bremer about this specific point on, on governance and how we move our way through the governance equation in Iraq. We're pretty much through it in Afghanistan. They had their, their constitutional lawyer, Jerry, got a constitution. They're heading towards elections, hopefully, this, this summer. Iraq, you know, there's still some debate between the UN and, uh, and the Coalition Provisional Authority uh, on how that will work itself out and when and where and so forth. Uh, but I think it's been informed all the way along by exactly what you said. I'm wondering about the uh, disbanding of the Iraqi army. Why was the entire thing dissolved rather than just the uh, officers and the Republican Guard being gotten rid of? A couple, a couple of points. On the, uh, for those that don't know, the Iraqi armed forces had regular divisions which were not the trusted divisions, the conscripts and so forth. Then they had the Republican Guards and the Special Republican Guards and Special Security Organization and on off the hierarchy of trustworthiness, if you will. And the question is, why didn't we retain more of the, the regular army, uh, understanding that maybe the Republican Guards were too close to the regime, at least in some of the leadership positions, to be kept. Um, I think the facts on the ground were that um, a lot of these folks just disappeared. They just fled, and they were not available I mean, a lot of, that was mainly a conscript army. And uh, either once the shooting started and they thought they could get away with it, they just went back to where they came from. And they really weren't available. What we've tried to do is, uh, is get young people and, and up to a certain level of leadership in the old uh, Iraqi army that want to continue to serve their country to come back and be part of their police, be part of the facilities protection service. You know, come, come back. You've had, they've had some training. so come back and we can get them up to speed faster, if you will. And so we've tried to do that. But I think it was a, the practical aspect that these, 
these divisions would just, the troops would just go. It was, uh, it was amazing, matter of fact. Thank you. you. I'm a professor of international business at the University of Baltimore. But, you said that this is a, a war that we all have to fight together. Um, I'm looking at the education of our young people coming out of science, engineering, and international business, areas where traditionally the freedom to share information, uh, technology, and basic science has been uh, one of our strengths. And I look at the university systems, our syllabuses and our, the, our ways of educating. We're not offering a counterbalancing um, opportunity for students to study um, control of technology in terms of what is in the national security, uh, what kinds of technology should be controlled and what should be allowed through uh, freedom of uh, journals, publications, and other sources. Is there some way that the military can work with universities to um, give us modules or design parts of a curriculum that we could add to our institutions in this area? Well, that's a very good question, and I don't, I don't know that it's not happening, but you would probably know. You'd probably try to find if there are ways. Um, but I can get you in touch with somebody who would know exactly the answer to that, because he's been a dean at an engineering school before, and now he's uh, uh, working in defense in the, in the technical side of things, and he's really good. That would be great. Also an astronaut, so he's, but he's very good. And uh, I'll, after this, uh, just come up and I'll make sure we get you in touch. Thank if you. If you give us a card, okay? okay? thank you. I would also add to your list of things that I think, you know, this is way outside my league now, but, um, you know, teaching people in the sciences also leadership and management is an important piece. And I think a lot of, a lot of universities and schools are starting to do that, but it's not enough just to arm them with the, the scientific knowledge. They have to have the wherewithal to communicate and, and make the kind of things they want to make happen, happen. So. General, I was struck by it. One uh, uh, time I heard General Schwarzkopf talk, and in his remarks, he remarked that during Desert Shield, he often would ask himself, uh, God, why me? <laughs> and, uh, and there is a terrible weight of responsibility that falls to so many. And certainly, uh, uh, the responsibility which falls to you at this time, which is an extraordinarily difficult time, is extraordinarily heavy and difficult. And I know that everyone here um, empathizes uh, with that task, and we appreciate very much the uh, energy that you're devoting to it. Uh, beyond that, we simply thank you for a thoroughly enjoyable evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.